almost over, everybody. But as we look at the month of August, we had plenty of summer to go around. This is the Something in the Air podcast. I'm your all, Joe Martin. You join with me, New Jersey State climatologist, my birthday buddy as well, Dr. Dave Robinson. Hey, we're pretty far away from our birthday month, but it seems like summer was so new and so fresh in May, May 13th for our birthdays. Now it's, you know, a couple of my friends are kind of done with summer at this point. I'm done with the heat and humidity. I'll tell you that much, but I was done with that by the end of June. Mm. You're well, I listen, you are the, are you the snow king from the snow king? You're on the Rutgers global snow lab. Uh, so you're itching for those first couple of flakes to be flying. Have we seen any flakes fly in August somewhere in the United States so far this month? Um, yeah. In Alaska, um, Denali, <laughs> Denali headquarters had a good half foot over the weekend and about 10 days ago, we started seeing some snow up in the eastern side of the Brooks Range, uh, way up there um, between the lower middle section and the tundra of the north. So, yeah, the flakes are flying at higher elevations uh, up in Alaska. Lower 48, I've not heard of any yet. Got it. Okay. Well, you know what? Let me ask you a trivia question, if you don't mind. When was the earliest flakes we've seen on record in New Jersey? Oh, yeah, you could have at least prepped me for that, couldn't you? Oh, um, oh yeah, hard one. The, um, yeah, what was it, October 3rd or 4th back in, oh, I should know this, 86 or 87, we had pretty good snow. So we probably saw some flurries um, in September in the past. We've had a gotcha. few late August freezes up in Layton and up in the valleys of Sussex County. Um, and we could very well see the first freeze in a northern valley um, as we get into September. Um, and sometimes before we end the uh, solar summer, if you will, not the meteorologic and climatologic summer, which September 1st. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let, let's talk about it. We have climatological summer. Uh, ends on August 31st, and then we have climatological fall, which starts on September 1st. So climatological fall are the three months between the summer part and the winter part here. Um, just for everybody listening, what is the difference between climatological summer and astronomical summer, which is not until later in the month in September? Yeah, the climatologists basically looked in the middle latitudes here at the three warmest months of the year, June, July, and August, the three coldest, December, January, and February, and then took the other three months for spring and fall as transition periods. That was back in a time when we only had the ability on paper with paper records at, to look monthly, and we didn't have digital files of daily data. Um, so we were not looking at things astronomically. We were looking at things more in a month by month basis. So, you know, I, I, advised a, a graduate student over a decade ago, and we kind of set our own seasons geographically around the world by when a certain threshold was met. So some of the polar regions never had summer because they never met the criteria. And so, of right. course, tropical regions never got into winter. Um, so it was really interesting. Um, and we published a little on it, but we're still talking about publishing more. So we let the climate tell us when the seasons begin and end, not the calendar. And with that, right. you can start looking at climate change. And we were seeing a compression of the winter, an expansion of the summer, which actually was putting some stresses on fall and, and spring. You think they would get longer, but if summer gets longer, that pushes back against fall and spring on each end. Um, but maybe that's made up by winter getting shorter. So it's really yeah. interesting. It warrants a lot more study as we, an, another tool to look at climate change. I'll tell you what, you know, I get comments from people every once in a while saying, it feels like our seasons just always get shifted later, like September, summer. And then some people will say, you know, April still feels like March. You know, could you go a little more in detail for New Jersey and what we're seeing? Yeah, I, I don't know if I'd say that for April and, and March, but definitely September and summer. And I've even talked to colleagues about this. I have a colleague who just retired from the University of Delaware. And he was telling me one time, he goes, I've ridden my bike to campus for years. And he goes, it used to be at the beginning of the fall semester, I'd have a jacket on and long pants. 
and he goes for in recent years way into September, I'm wearing shorts and no jacket. So it was a really interesting anecdotal type of assessment of how the, the climate has changed at the beginning of the semester. Yeah. And, and, and I really buy into that. Our summers are getting longer. And with that, we're wearing our summer clothes well past Labor Day. Yeah. And schools need air conditioning. You, know, you see more schools are always building air conditioning store, you know, for September and even, you know, parts of May and definitely June as well. So it's just another addition. You know, I remember, I believe at one point in time, right? I don't think all the, uh, even all the dorms at Rutgers where you work, I don't think they were even all air conditioned at one point in time. No, I'm sure they're, they're not. But I mean, let's look at it. We've had heat before. I started yeah. late September, my college years, long time ago. And we we're in the middle of a record breaking heat wave. I was in <laughs> Pennsylvania um, and, and there wasn't a fan to be found in, <laughs> in the community nor obviously any air conditioning in the dorms. And it was hot. And one of our worst heat waves on record for any time of the year in the, in the summer season was, was it 51 or 52, um, right around Labor Day, the last couple of days of August, first yeah. couple of days of September, where we were above 100 multiple days in a row. So it's not like we didn't have this heat early and late in the summer season in the past. Right. It's, I speak these days more to the duration and the persistence of the heat. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And that's what's making it so much warmer. It's not that we're shattering daytime records, at least for maximum temperature, sometimes for minimum temperature. It's just the persistence of the warmth. We just can't keep, catch a break. And then it's extending earlier into the season and later into the season. So yeah. a lot of work requiring study and better understanding beyond the simple fact that the atmosphere is getting warmer are it's the atmospheric circulation pattern of the mid-Atlantic changing that's influencing this increased warmth. I, I'll tell you what, I think people who are listening or watching probably remember in 2018, we were very warm and very humid right through Columbus Day. Um, I remember coming into work every morning. I'm like, geez, like it's like September 29th. It's like 76 degrees. And it was just so humid because we had this persistent southerly wind that kept blowing in. And of course, waters are still warm in September. And it took until one cold front Columbus Day weekend. And it was like, all right, fall can begin. But there was no taste. And I was thinking about that actually earlier today, driving down about just how persistent I, it might have been. I would have to look. I'm not going to, I'll check as, as you talk, but it was definitely up there for one of the warmest Septembers on record. God, I'm going to look while, while you're talking here. No, it, it, it's possible. Let's not just forget the first full weekend of November last year when mm -hmm. it hit 80 in New Brunswick for the latest 80 degree temperature on record in 125 years in New Brunswick. Um, now, that didn't mean it hadn't been cold before that point. And I believe we had had a couple freezes before that. Um, so, you know, those, but again, those singleton anomalies that happen now and again have always happened now and again. Now, the frequency of them may be increasing. But again, what I find so noticeable is just how persistent the warmth is. We're not getting those cold, cool dry air masses down from Canada is often during the summer to let us kind of catch our breath. Now, with that being said, the beginning of August this year, the first couple of days of August, people may not remember, but it got into the 40s and 50s in a lot of the yeah. state, the low temperatures, and it was delightful and somewhat unseasonable. Um, since then, the first week, I'm jumping ahead when we're talking August. That's all right. Uh, you know, down in um, Atlantic City at, at the um, at the airport, the first eight days of August were below normal. This the rest of the month, with one day the exception, was above normal every day. <laughs> so the first week I, of the listen, month yeah. below normal. The last three and a half weeks of the month almost every single day was above normal in the temperature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we didn't break run record high at all no. during the month of August. And I, I don't think that was true for anywhere in South, at least for South Jersey during that period of time. But like no. you said, we had this 
persistent heat. And we had a heat wave, you know, three plus days of 90 degree or greater heat just last week, meaning the first full week of August. It was the 24th to the 27th here. That was heat wave number five. And actually, I, I'm doing a study. Um, I'm doing a report. This is actually going to come out. So if you guys are listening on the first, should be coming out a couple of days after this about just heat waves in the area and maybe some different ways of defining it. But what I found was the 30-year average of heat waves, we now average 2.8 heat waves a year on average at Atlantic City International Airport. When records first started, those first 30-year period, 1943 and 1972, 1.8. So we've had an extra heat wave a year, and that's an extra three days of 90 degree or greater heat. So it's just, you know, not necessarily breaking the records, but we're just having this more persistent heat, exactly to your point. Well, you know how I feel about that. I don't like counting heat waves. Well, I like, that's, counting, yeah. I like counting days over 90 because you could have a 10 day 90 plus run and that's one heat wave. Or yeah. you could have three three day runs and that's three heat waves, which is more impressive. So yeah. I, you know, I would, I would, I love the idea of looking at it because it gives you some idea of duration of the heat and that's important for health consequences. So what you're doing is, is definitely worth doing, but I would no, also, no, accompany offense, take it. I, no, 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 I absolutely. But I would accompany it with just the number of days over 90 that yeah. we've experienced. And, and then another way we've been looking at it for a project I'm doing with some of the folks at our Institute of Health, um, we're looking at probabilities. So we're defining any day of the year, I can tell you what's the 1% probability of getting over a certain high temperature or the 5% or the, the 10%. And with that, you can define it's not a heat wave in the winter, but I can tell you when there's an unusually warm winter day or summer day or any time right. of the year for that matter. And then we try to look at the number of days where you're above 5% limit. Um, and it's pretty rare. Let's take some cooler thoughts. I can't even get my words straight. Cooler thoughts on the other side of this break. We're going to come back. We're going to finish up temperatures. We're going to talk about precipitation because it was very wet. And we'll talk about some more here. This is the Something in the Air podcast. Hey, everyone. I'm meteorologist Joe Martucci at the Press of Atlantic City. Every time I do a talk, I say, if I could take this job again, I'd take it 10 times out of 10. I'm the only meteorologist at a newspaper in New Jersey. And down here in southeastern New Jersey, you all know weather matters more. Whether it's for farming, it's for the beach, or for your business. Weather plays a huge role here in I'm making sure I'm doing things that cater to you, whether it's talking about if your street's gonna have coastal flooding or whether you need the air conditioner on at night at the shore. We're the only place that's doing a mainland and shore seven day forecast. We're the only ones that are talking about whether your street is going to have coastal flooding. And that's why I wanna keep this going. All right, everyone, we're back with the Something in the Air podcast here with uh, soon-to-be 30-year state climatologist, Dr. Dave Robinson. So you have been state climatologist, like you said, for 30 years. I was three and a half months old when you became state climatologist. And I think, as you said, off camera, it's like Queen Elizabeth and then you. So how's it feel? Yeah, I've only known one queen of England or king or queen of England since I've been alive. And yeah. you've only known one state climatologist, almost, we know almost. One. almost. Since, well, I've been literally that. remembering. It's since I could actually remember, it would be you. Yeah. yeah 30 that, years. I was thinking, what has lasted more than 60 years? And, and all I could think of was from Queen Elizabeth. Queen Elizabeth. The space age hasn't been that long and whatever no. it goes. So God bless her. Uh, it's amazing. And... Uh, you know, for me, I was just a child when I became state climatologist, obviously. Um, but holy right. mackerel, 30 years, just it's just remarkable. And I'm still not satisfied <laughs> with what we've well, done. I think uh, your work shows that you're never satisfied because you're always trying to improve, you know, especially with the public facing website, of course, you know, um, with the Office of New Jersey State Climatologist, you have your revamped mass pages, which is always extremely incredible. And you also have your new Tornadoes website that just came up in the past couple of weeks. So, you know, 
I could, you know, I could say how grateful we are for hours and hours, but the point is you've done a lot of work and, you know, we'll look forward, we'll look forward to the next 30 years, right? Um, yeah, sure. Um, okay. awesome. But here. there will be more, stay tuned. We've got some more products ready to come up and if we ever get the resources, some further revamping of websites and all. So you can see, I just still, still want things to be better and, and then ultimately leave things mm. for yeah. the next person to come along and, and lead it. the state climate program. So, uh, Got it. You know, but not, not right now. No, not right now. Right now we're going to talk about August a little bit more. We're going to just kind of tidy this up with a bow here. So where did we end up statewide for our temperatures for the month as a whole? We talked about the specific dates. Well, let's just talk about the month as a whole. Yeah, just generally our preliminary numbers for the state, we're going to end up clearly in the top 10, probably the fourth or fifth warmest August on record. And when we look back at June, July, and August, it's going to be in the top 10, probably number six for warmth. Uh, and that's a ho-hum because all the top 10 have been since 1999. And we go back to 1895. Um, and nine of the 10 have been since 2005. So the beat goes on. Summers are getting warmer in New Jersey. That's a big ticket item. So yeah. warmth prevails. Again, the persistence we were talking about um, yep. with June, July, and August, each being warmer than average. Mm -hmm. And you wanted to point out something about Ford's view in Atlantic City Marina. Yeah, I mean, it's been, as we've talked about numerous times in the past, it's the nighttime warmth. There's so much moisture in the atmosphere this summer. The lows didn't fall much. Atlantic City Marina, Fortescue, a few other coastal stations never have dropped below 70 degrees in the month of August. And Atlantic City Marina... Um, didn't drop below 80 degrees on the, um, what day was it? I wrote it down somewhere. I'm trying to look. I can't find it right now. Uh, but Atlantic City Marina um, didn't get, it was like the 13th of August. It was, I believe it was the 13th. I think that's what you were saying off camera, 13th. Yeah. And last month, Fortescue didn't drop below 80 uh, one, one morning. So, uh, it's been the warmth that's ranked up maybe like the third warmest for lows in the month of August. Um, the high temperatures are ranking up around 30th warmest high temperatures. So again, there's our point. It's persistent, not only all the days, but day and night. And we're not yeah. breaking those high temperature records, which you've mentioned. Um, I haven't looked. We probably broke some high minimum records. So there we are. That's the yeah. temperature story. The warmth continues. And, um, you know, right now it looks like it's going to persist a little bit as we get into September. Which is good with me. We got local summer coming up after Labor Day. So the more days above 80 after Labor Day, the happier I am. So I'm cool with that. Uh, let's switch over to precipitation because that was. Well, let's say there was one event that made this a really big story. Um, we had the we had tropical storm on Ray or even Hurricane on Ray that came through, and went into Rhode Island. That's where the center of the storm went. But we saw a lot of rain in some parts of New Jersey. Now, admittedly, for us in South Jersey, we did not see you know egregious amounts of rain, with the exception of Ocean County, where we saw four to seven inches, including seven point oh one in the Brighton Beach section, but the northern half of the state, you know, north of Route 78, right? Pretty much essentially four to seven inches across the board, right? Yeah, I mean, the the we got a one-two punch from Henri, really. As the storm moved up the coast, ahead of it, there was a moist flow uh, with the, the moisture being fed in from the northern flank of Henri and in some, uh, what we call a trough off to our west. And that's when we got the overnight rains that Saturday into Sunday uh, down in Southern Middlesex of so six to eight inches. And uh, the northern end of LBI got hit the early part of that storm. And even up near um, New York City, Jersey City, Newark area, that Saturday evening, they got clobbered. That was the precursor for the main event of Henri, which once it made landfall in Rhode Island, moved off to the west 
And with that, its precipitation shield, just kind of like a waterfall fall, came down across southeastern New York into northern New Jersey and dropped six to eight inches of rain up in the highlands and, and four, six, seven inches of rain, really even a little below 78, but yeah, route one, 78 upwards. And with that, um, you combine the, those two episodes, the Raritan Basin had its most extensive flooding um, since the spring of 2014, and the Passaic Basin got up pretty high as well. Wow. Uh, one place that didn't get up high is the Cape May bubble. I'm looking at your map right now from the weekend. We had 0.24 in villas. I think I'm seeing a 0.15 in Sea Isle City. Wasn't Cape May storm. Cape May bubble did its job. It had a little bit of bubble, but that bubble burst on this past Sunday when yes, there did. was an area around Ocean City and over to Summers Point that got clobbered with two, three inches of rain and nobody else got anything around the, almost the entire state. And there was one other episode in, in August that date escapes me right now, where Cape May County was the focal point of the precipitation. Mainly they dodged it, but let, let's, before we run out of time, let's look at some yeah. of those numbers. Yeah, um, yeah, let's do it. You know, I give you our Cocoraz extremes every month and, and for Atlantic County, um, in August, uh, 9.20 inches at Summers Point, thanks in part to the Sunday rain, was number one, followed by Egg Harbor City at 9.04. Now, on the low end, wasn't all that low, 4.76 inches at both Estelle Manor and Hamilton. So that's, that's pretty normal, if not a little bit above normal for August. And that was the lowest amounts for Atlanta yeah. County. Now go down to Cape May. Um, Ocean City, thanks to the three inches there, came in at 9.91 inches for the month. <laughs> and Woodbine at 6.64. But then you go down the Cape some and Lower Township came in lowest, lowest uh, for lower. 4.76. And another one of our stations, excuse me, was 4.66 in Lower Township. Mm -hmm. So again, that's a little above normal for Lower Township in yeah. a normal month of August. So then let's go up the coast a little. And yeah. there, your winners was Stafford Township. And if you remember a couple summers ago, Stafford, it just wanted the rain as well. Yeah, that was two years ago. A station there, 11.89 inches in, in August, and Long Beach Township, 10.77. Uh, yeah. But on the low end, head up to the northern part of the county, uh, Point Pleasant Beach, 3.58 inches, and Brick, 4.92. So really, Point Pleasant Beach just dodged the storms. Yeah, yeah. Suppose the storms dodged them time and again. They were one of the few parts of the state, along with parts of, of, of um, Salem, a little bit of Gloucester, and a little spot actually in Mercer County up around Lambertville. They're about the only parts of the state that had below the long-term normal of precip in, in August. The rest of the state was above normal or well above normal. Yeah. And I'm imagining as we go into uh, September, I'm guessing that's probably pretty good news for fall foliage that we've been wet during the summer. Yeah, yeah, great, great, great point. Um, something I haven't yeah, thought I about, like yet, but it, it makes sense when your your trees are well hydrated um, that they're not going to suffer from an early leaf turn and drop sometimes with little to no color to it. Yeah. Um, and now, so we're going to have the moisture in place. The question now, will we have too much, which could impact some color, but now we start looking at the temperature as we get into late September and October to get the vibrant colors. Everything I read tells you that you need cool nighttime temperatures. Warm days are fine, but you need to start giving the, the trees, besides just the sun angle coming down, you need the temperatures to come down to give the trees a hint that the seasons are changing and that leads to better color. So part one is fulfilled. The ground moisture is such that the trees aren't stressed. Now part two depends a lot on the temperature. 
And then, you know what I always say, part three, what's the weather like in October? Um, are, our wind, are our weekends cloudy? Do we get a lot of windy rainstorms to knock the leaves yeah. off the trees faster? So that's the aesthetic part of it. Um, but the, the precursors of precip and temperature were okay on one hand. Let's see what the thermometer is going to do on the other. Yeah. And, you know, for even in the northwest corner of the state, we start seeing good color in late September on average. And then it slowly works its way down the state as we go through the month. Late October is usually where we see it in southeastern New Jersey. Yeah. Was I right I mean, on that? Was, it, was it my little early in northwestern Jersey? I'm not too no, keen in that color. area. To see yeah. some color. But you're, you're going to peak in northwest Jersey 10th to the 15th, maybe the 15th of the month about a week to 10 days later in central Jersey and really Halloween into the first couple of days of November uh, yeah. in the south part of the state. Now that's general because it depends on species of trees and even sure. trees of the same species. I've grown up in my yard seeing sugar maples lose their leaves weeks apart and it looks like it's the same tree. <laughs> um, so there's a lot of variability there, but it's starting to look good. It, you know, the hope is that we're going to have a good season. Yeah, no, fingers crossed. I would love that, especially this year. Um, I want to wrap up with a couple of small things here. I just want to talk about coastal flooding um, real quick. And the reason why I say real quick, we just saw two high tide cycles that were in minor flood stage. That was with Andre. And I think I said this before to you, but it has really been a good year for coastal flooding. We have not seen a lot of it, minus that late January into early February storm. Our shore has been pretty good this year. We still have hurricane season to go, of course, but pretty good so far. Yeah, no, it, it's it's been terrific. And you have to remember, Henri came with a full moon. So that yeah. helped bring the, the, the levels up a little bit. And it could have been real bad had the storm mm -hmm. a nasty turn. So, yeah, I mean, the beaches are about as good as you could expect them uh, to go through 12 months without a lot of major storms eating away at the at the shoreline is, is really a bonus. Uh, again, I hate to say it, but one major storm, all of that work could be removed. Let's yep. hope that's not the case with the remaining tropical season. And then let's look for the winter <laughs> season. And right now, if we're going into a La Nina pattern, again, for the second yep. year in a row, that tends to reduce the number of coastal storms. Storms yep. tend to go up through the Great Lakes. So we might have another bonus um, season ahead. No guarantees there, but that would be the probabilities would trend toward fewer coastal winter storms with a La Nina. And again, it still remains to be determined whether we slide into that and the um, how strong it might be. Yeah, no, great point. And also, you know, you're saying with that storm track cutting through the Great Lakes, that usually means we're on the warm and less snowy side of the storm, which is unfortunate for both of us, especially you, Mr. Snow King, because you like your uh, cross-country skiing as well. We want to make sure we get you some days out there this winter. Yeah, I mean, last winter we had February and mostly up in my neck of the woods because of that one major storm. Um, the South did better than the year before, but you can't do any worse. It can't do yeah. any worse than the winter of 2019. Uh, the floor 20, is like way down here. 20, uh, you know, 2019, yeah. 20, 2021 was about average, a little below, I think, yeah. down at Cape May County. Um, but overall, <laughs> anything beat nada, which yeah. was the, the 1920. There was rough. I was actually just telling somebody, I, God, I, I want to say it was Friday. I remember measuring 0.8 from that four-day long nor'easter at the end of January to the beginning of February, 0.8. But I saw all my friends there with all the snow. I saw you with the snow. We did have that kind of South Jersey special event. Um, I think it was later in the month of February where we picked up like maybe a two to four, and it was really a South Jersey thing. And that really saved us from it being below average again. But we have plenty of time to talk about winter. I like the heat. I think many people here are looking forward to local summer September here as the crowds start to thin out. So we'll hope for at least, you know, good beach weather, not too humid, just, you know, 80s, drier side as we go forward in time. Um, anything else you want to add before we wrap up here for uh, the month? Yep. Well, hey, 
thanks again for uh, joining us here for another month. I'm going to hope to see you at the Emergency Management Conference in AC. So maybe we'll get a picture. We'll put it out to the people. But uh, that's it, everybody. We are going to be back with you the third Wednesday of September, which is September 15th, with another friend of ours, Fred Akers, is actually joining us. Coco Ross Observer. Extraordinary. Yes, Coco Ross Extraordinary. He was the first guy in Atlanta County to have a Coco Ross station. Uh, he's putting, he talked about Coco Ross a little bit. We actually pre recorded this. So we talked about Coco Ross a little bit. We talked mostly about his work with the uh, Greater Egg Harbor River. Um, watershed so fantastic fabulous, fabulous non-governmental organization and others involved down there just top notch top notch yeah absolutely so everybody uh, stay tuned for that and then we'll be back as we go into early october we'll recap september and then winter's really starting to knock on the door by that point so we'll see what happens so everybody thank you for watching take care stay safe